When I first met my now husband, I was young, naive, and too curious of a person for my own good. At the time, I was newly pregnant, and we were living in an apartment with my sister. One day, we were in a conversation about the paranormal. As a child, I had many things happen that I couldn't explain, or that were terrifying and we were telling stories. My husband was being super skeptical about every story told. So me and my sister, being ignorant, suggested we go buy a Ouija board and show him that spirits were real. I had heard horror stories about the board, even from my own father, but I was that person that had to find out for myself. Oh, how naive and stupid I was. I now realize. We bought a board and at first, we took it to a park to try it out, trying to separate it from home. Nothing was happening and we were getting frustrated. So we left for home. After we got home, my sister kept going on about trying it again. Eventually we agreed and took it to my bedroom to play despite my hesitation. After a few minutes of no response, the planchet eventually moved to yes after asking if any spirits were there. We were pretty excited that it was moving and even tried to debunk if the other could move if it to be funny. Right away, the planchet wouldn't answer questions, but kept moving in a figure eight motion over and over. We eventually got tired of its lack of response and gave up. A few days later, my sister came to me upset and said that the night before, her door was shaking violently. It was closed and it was like someone was pushing the door back and forth. She seemed pretty freaked out. I just listened, but in my mind, I wasn't perceiving it as that big of a deal. A few nights later, my husband and I were laying in bed trying to sleep. All of a sudden, our bedroom door started to shake back and forth, just like my sister described. But it was definitely not as minor as I thought. The door was shaking rapidly and violently. I woke my husband and said, look at the door. He just stared at it and said, what the hell? We watched it shake for a few minutes and then it eventually stopped. When it did stop, my husband got up and looked out in the hall and checked on my sister. No one was there and she was fast asleep. We just kind of shook it off. For months, the door shaking happened to one of us almost every night. We started staying at my parents' house more often just to avoid the freaky nights. One night, I was about seven months pregnant at this time. I had taken my husband's kids to school that morning. He has two kids from a previous marriage and I was extremely tired that morning. So when I returned home, I decided to go back to bed for a little while. I was sleeping when I was all of a sudden awoken with the feeling of something crawling or walking along my feet on the bed. I sat up and looked, nothing was there. I thought I just dreamed it and fell back asleep. Then I was awoken again, thinking something was crawling or walking towards me on the bed. I sat up and again, nothing was there. I told myself it was a dream again and laid back down. I was trying to fall back asleep when I felt it again. This time I wasn't asleep. It felt like when a cat is walking towards you on a bed. Very light, but distinct like paws. We don't have a cat or any animal due to my severe allergies to them. I shot up in bed and looked, but saw nothing there. That time I was really freaked out and realized I wasn't dreaming the first two times I felt it either. I got out of that apartment so fast and refused to go back in until my husband got home. It really shook me up. We moved out of that apartment about a month later. I do believe that something attached to us as we have had a lot of freaky experiences still since using that board, but that's for another long story. I'd be happy to share if people are interested. I still wonder if tenants still have the door shake at night in that apartment or if it left with me. I won't ever play with a Ouija board again. It started roughly a week ago and has happened multiple times. First of all, I want to mention that I live alone and I don't have any pets. Last week, 
I went to sleep around 2 a.m. and I had my MacBook Pro closed completely on the floor. While I was in bed, I started to hear typing on the keyboards. It wasn't cracking or anything like that. It was typing and I'm not imagining it at all. It lasted several minutes and then eventually stopped. I freaked out like crazy that night, but eventually managed to fall asleep. The next day, I also went to bed late. I fell asleep and woke up in the middle of the night by the typing noise of the keyboard. It wasn't a dream, nor am I crazy. It really happened. I was very scared, so I turned on the lights and the typing stopped. My computer was still closed and shut down. So I turned off the lights and 10 minutes later, I heard the typing on my keyboard again. This time too, it lasted for a long time. I almost had a panic attack. Keep in mind, I live alone. It happened again on other nights. Every time it happens after I go to sleep. It can be right after I fall asleep and put the MacBook down or many hours later in the, in the early morning while I'm still asleep. It never happens while I'm using the keyboard myself. Last night, I also couldn't sleep because I heard weird noises coming from the window, like some weird gush of wind, loud noises around my windows, and of course, the typing on my computer. I'm terrified. What can that be? I was thinking I'm either spied by some agency that managed to infiltrate my computer and search for something, but what? I've got nothing to hide and I'm a completely average guy, never committed any crime whatsoever. And even then, if the computer is closed, how can I hear the typing? I mean, even if they infiltrated, I shouldn't hear typing on my keyboard. Or is it something paranormal? I read I'm not the first guy who heard the type of typing of keyboard at night, and other people who experienced it were equally frightened. Some of them use the mechanical keyboard, which is exposed at night. I have a MacBook Pro and my keyboard isn't exposed because at night I close my PC in the sense that I shut the screen above my keyboard so it's not exposed. Help me figure out what it can be. So for some context, my dad passed away at the very end of January this year. I suspect it was an accidental overdose because of his substance abuse issues, but no one in the family wanted to look further into it, so we never got a further autopsy. I think his autopsy note said something like a heart attack. He usually texted and called me daily and saw me weekly, but after not texting me for a few days, I got worried and called the police to do a welfare check. An hour later, they called back with the news. Unfortunately, he is deceased. Those words run through my head now all the time. I had deep regrets when he passed. He was, also a, he was always a hypochondriac and also just coming up with excuses and minor problems that only I could be able to fix, i.e. the Netflix was broken. He usually just didn't know how to restart the PS3 when the app crashed. Or my rabbit who he cared for was sick so when he texted me at odd hours, a couple days before I called the police, saying that my rabbit wasn't eating, I didn't take him very seriously. I had met him for lunch a day before he stopped responding, and he was very shaky and said he wasn't feeling well. But he said that weekly, so I figured I had no reason to worry. It's been the same story for years. I was wrong. Once I got that phone call back saying he was gone, my world stopped. For the past several months, I've been fairly in denial. I went through his belongings after it happened, but my family weren't interested in helping, and we ultimately ended up hiring a lady to do an estate sale for us. I grabbed what I could think to hold on to, and ended up with a lot of stuff in boxes that I hadn't looked through too well. This will be relevant later. A few weeks ago, I had a dream. I haven't dreamed of him since he passed. When it first happened, I wished to see him one last time. But as time went on, I began to give up on seeing his ghost or presence again. That idea fully faded away, so I'm forever grateful for this experience I was given weeks ago. I dreamed that I was in a house I didn't recognize. It was clearly very old. My dad was born in 1947, if that holds any relevance to this house being so old. 
I walked up to a kitchen island and sat at a bar stool, which is when I see my dad, easily 20 years younger, walk out of a room opposite from me. A small brown and white dog I had never seen before comes out with him. I remember not being able to identify the breed, but the characteristics of the dog burned into my memory. Black nose, fluffy, brown with white or blonde patches and very small. He followed the dog walking towards me. I forget how the conversation started, but I know I began crying rather quickly. He looked so good. He was wearing a long sleeve blue platen dress shirt he used to wear a long time ago. I cried and he asked me, what's wrong kiddo? I'm better now, you don't believe me? And I responded with, I do believe you. You look happier and healthier, that's why I'm crying. He told me not to worry, he would be okay and so would I. And then he said goodbye, left the door and I woke up sobbing. It was a good bit of closure for me and I've hung on to it since it happened. I figured my mind was creating that memory for me, to cheer me up and provide me that closure. But two days ago, I started sorting through some stuff that's been in boxes for several months and I came across a folder I don't remember. It was full of old pictures, his old girlfriends in the 60s and 70s, cars and stuff. I didn't remember grabbing it, but it was a nice bit of memories to hold on to. One picture stood out though. It made me genuinely lose my breath and tear up when I saw it. That exact same little dog from that dream who I'd never seen in my life. A photograph that was decades old. I texted my aunt and she confirmed that it was one of my favorite little dogs. I forget what she said his or her name was. I didn't even tell her what had happened. I described the dog and she told me how much she loved that dog without skipping a beat. I like to believe it really was my dad in that dream. He had the strength to come back and bring one of his favorite pups along with him because he was a huge animal lover and I wouldn't expect it any other way. I don't know what I believe happened to us with everything is over, but I believe wherever he is, he's happy. And I'm forever thankful for that. While I was still in college, I was going through a major breakup. I started experiencing aura headaches. They made it so I couldn't speak, text, type or write. It was super difficult because my roommates at the time were involved in the breakup mess and the headaches made me look insane. One night, I got in the shower after feeling like a sad sack all day. I felt this sudden sense of clarity. I thought I realized I need to take a break and head to my parents' house. I was so calm after the shower, it felt amazing. My thoughts hadn't been clear since the breakup. To be honest, before I took the shower, I had no idea what day it was. The clarity was so nice and I felt so calm. I hurried up and packed and was out the door around half 10 in the evening. It felt like I was doing the right thing. It's important to note that there were two ways to get to my parents' house from my university. The first way started out with a big canyon that led to a couple small towns before connecting to the main freeway. I always took this route because it had cell phone service throughout the entire drive. I can't handle driving if I don't have phone service. The second way takes you towards a resort type town. There's nothing before. There's hardly any cell phone service until you pass a really sketchy four way stop. I've only taken the route once or twice, but only because a group of friends were going to the resort town. I never personally drove there because like I said, Having no cell phone service sketches me out when I drive. My car at the time was a Subaru Outback and that thing usually blasted up the canyon. That night though, I couldn't get the car to go past 65 miles an hour. I was kind of worried, but I had an audiobook going so I was calm. I was listening to a collection of Winnie the Pooh series because it's innocent and it's what I needed. I'm headed up the first curve of the canyon and I noticed that the time is 11.11. I always make a wish around that time, so I made an embarrassing wish. I kept heading up the curve. Cars passed me for a bit. Suddenly, without a warning sign or anything, the lane merges into a side-by-side -side road. I realized 
nobody is behind me. And I'm freaking out because this one lane business does not happen at all along this route. The curve starts to turn into alternating curves. And they're like the kind where you can't see if anyone's coming the other way. I continue driving because I don't know what else to do. I'm in a forested area and it's super dark. I'm getting spooked, so I decide to call my mom. I reach for my phone and it's not on the passenger seats where I usually put it. At this point, I'm freaking out. I lock my doors and pull over, turn on the cab light, and I literally tear my car apart looking for my phone. I look under seats, I even look in the back. It's nowhere to be found. Up until I pulled over, my audiobook was playing. I remember because it was the story where Pooh and Piglet keep circling the tree following their own tracks. Once I realize my phone is nowhere to be found, the audiobook stops playing. I'm in hysterics at this point. I look around in an attempt to ground myself. I decide the only thing I can do at this point is continue forward to see if a town doesn't pop up so I can figure out where I am. I continue driving, paying close attention to my surroundings. I then realize there are no freaking pine trees around me. I'm in the mountain west region in the US, and if you're in the middle of nowhere, the one thing you can count on seeing is pine trees, especially in wooded areas. All the trees have no leaves. They're not dead exactly, but there are no leaves and there's no small vegetation. I continue driving forward. The road is nothing but endless curves. I look at my gas gauge, worried about gas because usually it takes about half a tank to get to my parents and I didn't want to break down. My gas tank is full, even though I didn't fill it up at all. There are no speed limits, no mileage markers. There's just curves, dirt and leafless trees. Until finally, I pass by a house. More houses appear and there's a church that pops into view. A church I used to go to as a kid, in a town about 40 miles away from my parents' place. The town isn't along the usual route I take. It's along the second route. And to get to this town, you have to turn abruptly at a four-way stop. I did no such thing. My audiobook turns on, and it's the part where Christopher Robin is asking Pooh to never forget him. I look over on my passenger seats, and my phone is there. I look down at my gas gauge and it's only a quarter full. The time now says 3.30 a.m. My phone has 15 missed calls from my mom because I was technically on the road for four hours. When I call to talk to her, I'm experiencing an aura headache and this one in particular was super bad. It lasted two days. I think a lot of people will think I just had a mental breakdown, but I don't think so. I can't explain what happened to me. Maybe someone on here can. This story has developed over years. I want to warn you from the very beginning that some of it will be unbelievable. For that reason, I've been reluctant to share it. These events started to unfold when I was at a crossroads in my life. Let's just say I took a wrong turn but I believe someone or something helped me find my way back. I was in the market for a place to rent and I was in a hurry. I knew of a mobile home that had sat empty since a friend of mine had gone to prison. There had been a few people move in, but they never stayed long. It was supposedly very haunted. It scared the crap out of most people, but I needed a place and was no stranger to the paranormal. I could handle it, surely. Not long after moving in, I began to wonder if that were true. Did I mention my friend had been convicted of murder and was serving a life sentence? Well, he told his sister when he found out that I had moved into his old place to tell me not to talk to them. They will make you do bad things. I considered what he said and realized it was too late for that because I had already been talking to them. That place was like Grand Central Station. You couldn't help but talk to them. There were two, however, that were scarier than the others. They were the only two that I could see clearly. One of them was very short, about four feet tall with a pale round face and what at the time appeared to be Batman ears. He wore what I thought was a long black coat or jacket. He 
it was accompanied by a large, dense, blacker than black mass. That black mass scared me more than the thing with the face. Okay, they were both intense. After a couple of encounters with these guys, I decided it was time to go. I found a little cabin out in the woods for the same rents and jumped on it. I moved into the furnished cabin and never really paid much attention to the art that littered the walls. That's until I started to experience sleep paralysis. The painting that was always in front of me when I come out of those episodes started to look scary to me. The same two beings from the mobile home were visiting me through sleep paralysis. The painting was of two owls on a branch. One was smaller than the other, and they always seemed to be staring at me intently. The first sleep episode was terrifying. The large black mass was pulling me, like trying to take me somewhere. The smaller of the two grabbed me, one hand around my throat and one hand under my arm, pulling back. The smaller one was trying to stop him. When I could move again, I could still feel his hands on me. That's when I noticed the painting and the way they stared at me. I was very confused by this incident. I just couldn't understand why one of them had saved me from whatever fate awaited me. I continued to have many other sleep paralysis episodes and other weird occurrences. It was as if I couldn't sit down in that house without falling asleep, even if I wasn't sleepy. My friends also felt this fatigue upon entering my abode. One of my friends had an episode of sleep paralysis, which I witnessed. I couldn't wake him up, even though he was looking right at me and mumbling something. He later told me that he could see me and hear me. He could also see something else, but couldn't tell me what it was. He said from his point of view, he was screaming and couldn't move no matter how hard he tried. All he said before leaving was, I'm sorry, I have to go. They're trying to kill me. He never visited me at that house again. It was around this time that I started to feel like these entities had attached to this painting for whatever reason. I thought, get rid of the painting, get some actual rest. So I decided to throw it out. A friend of a friend was over that day and said he wanted it. I told him it wasn't a good idea and why. He informed me that he didn't believe in that nonsense. I gave it to him reluctantly. I continued to see the entities in my dreams after that and always had the feeling that there was a presence with me. Now I know that's a vague statement, but I don't know any other way to put it. As I mentioned before, I took a wrong turn at that intersection I was at. I could no longer afford rent anywhere, so I kind of drifted after that. These two entities were with me every bit of the way, it seemed. Sometimes more than others, and I kind of got used to them. Fast forward about a year later, and about 250 miles from where this story began, I'd gotten myself stranded. I called a friend of mine from back home, and he made the three hour drive to rescue me. He would become my boyfriend and later my fiance. It was at his home that I encountered the owl painting for a second time, in his bedroom, facing the bed. So after the initial what the fuck, I began to wonder if maybe this was all for a reason. I began trying to communicate on a more regular and real basis with these entities. I now know that I have never communicated with the black mass. I still don't understand what it is. I do believe I have a better understanding of the other one. After lots of weird failures and successes at communication, a name was just kind of inserted into my head. It said, Inky. I heard it, just like you hear your conscience or whatever. I immediately began researching. The only thing I ever found was some weird demon cartoon. I thought, well, that's weird, but I didn't really feel like it was the answer. I kind of let it go after that. They were still there, but I tried to ignore them. Then I watched a movie. This movie changed everything. It got me interested in ancient Sumeria. I never dreamed that I would find the key to all of this there. In my research, I discovered that there was an Anunnaki being named Enki. It just clicked into place like a damn puzzle piece. Then when I discovered the things that Enki gets credit for, it made even more sense for me. 
The images of what Enki was thought to look like always depict him with two horn-like protrusions from the top of his head. The clothing wasn't too far off either. It seems Enki is thought to be responsible for the conifer tablets that deal with magic, exorcism, and lots of other interesting things. There is also a story that says he was banished to the underworld and was the one that would drag you there when you died. You can look all this up yourselves. It's very interesting. To this day, I don't understand why he would want to contact me. All I know is that after I made that discovery, he was gone. At least, I haven't seen him since. That's not to say he won't be back. I would like to add, though, that after all of these events, my life finally got on the right track. I'm still engaged to that friend that drove all the way to pick me up and had that same owl pick. Our lives were in the toilets when we got together, and there wasn't much of a chance. We were going to change that. However, in the four years that we've been together, we went from a shack that was falling down around us to a three-story cabin on the river with a new Jaguar in the driveway. I can't help but wonder if we had some help getting together, if maybe that picture was a sign of some sort. The only thing I know for sure is that I am exactly where I'm supposed to be. Did the weird journey happen by chance? Or was it a guided journey? As I said, I know this sounds outrageous. That's why I've never shared this before. First off, I think it's important to note a couple of things. My wife is from Australia and I'm from Midwest America. I'm 33 and she's 26. We've been married almost a year now and recently we had been talking about UFOs. I can't remember who told their story first, but I remember telling mine. When I was about nine years old, I was riding in the back of my grandparents' car headed back to town. Glancing out of the left back seat window, I saw an athletic man, basically an athletic swimmer's build, running as fast or faster than the car, which had to have been going about 30 or 40 miles an hour. My dad and uncle were in a truck in front of us and they stopped abruptly. My grandparents followed and pulled over as well. Dad and uncle got out and asked my grandparents if they saw something in the bushes, but they didn't describe anything just as if they saw something. This being country town America, I don't suppose they wanted to say what they actually saw. The thing is, the athletic running man with no clothes on running through the large bushes also had a bluish or metallic-like tint to his skin, almost like Silver Surfer from the comics, but different, as if he had a membrane around his body and the blue metallic color was underneath. As I told my wife this story, she started agreeing with me about hers. She told me that she was about eight. She was waiting for her mother outside. She saw an athletic looking man with no clothes on peeking through tall bushes. And she described the exact same skin style as I did. I know this sounds how it sounds, but searching the internet for any similar sightings, all I can find is stuff about Atlanteans. I mean, to each their own, but I don't really believe in Atlantis. However, as I was talking about it, the whole thing of me remembering the swimmer's body type, it at least seemed like mentioning. I remember my grandparents saying they didn't see anything, but tomorrow I'm at least going to ask my grandmother if she remembers that day and pulling over the car to look for whatever my dad, uncle and myself saw. Also, if anyone else has ever seen such a thing, please let me know. By the time I was 12 years old, I was no stranger to sleep paralysis. It seemed to be some sort of hereditary thing. As my mother told me before her father passed away, he finally told all his children about how sometimes when he would lay down to sleep, he would experience things. Said he would feel like something took him on a tour through what he considered to be hell. Once I was told this information, well, Anyone who's experienced with sleep paralysis knows it spreads almost like a contagious virus to people. 
just as my mother explained it to me. And that very night in the summer I had turned 12 began my lifetime with sleep paralysis. It would also affect my spouses over the years who didn't believe me. However, the night upon telling them, they would experience it. This story actually begins way before any of that. And the reason I brought it up was to set the stage for the fact I know the difference between being in sleep paralysis and being truly awake. See, I never believed in ghosts. I knew sleep paralysis was real and I knew its effects on the mind, body and soul. More importantly, in my time with it, I learned how to control it, how to manipulate it. And if I couldn't, then at the very least awake from it. This story to me is more unsettling. Compared to the first few weeks of active sleep paralysis as a kid, where I'd stay awake playing games until the sun came up, being in deep depression, drug use, and lots of pot smoking as a teen, it eventually overcoming the fear. Ultimately having some kind of rationale grasp on what sleep paralysis is, and the fact I do have control of it. This, this was something different. One morning in 2016, I woke up just like every other morning and walked over to my PC, turning it on to my favorite music of the time. Probably some kind of video game radio station like Fallout. I remember an old timey song playing as I scrolled through my favorite conspiracy theory sites. And it wasn't long into that morning, I had three very vivid flashbacks. They all took place in an old house my mother, brother and I used to live in back when she was a single parent. My family, an old Italian family, had made roots in our small little town in southern Oklahoma. The building, which was their restaurant, was an old house turned into a successful restaurant with add-ons over the years. That building had its own history and some type of energy with activity, but that's another story. We lived a few houses down from that building. The first flashback started out while I was as tall as my mother's knees. I was about four to five years old in all of these. My vision of FPV of running up to her while she was doing the dishes and grabbing her leg, not wanting to look towards the right, that's where a side entrance to the house was. I remember feeling like someone was standing in there, a tall man with a tall hat. The second flashback was me sitting in an old style bathtub, playing with my Robocop and Batman toys. All of a sudden, I became very scared a tingle shot up my spine and down my back, and the feeling of something staring into my back was so intense, I wanted to turn around. But at the same time, I was basically paralyzed from fright. The last flashback is by far the most unsettling. The house was just a normal, small squared house. All rooms were basically connected by doors, and my room was directly connected to the side entrance of the house I spoke about earlier. I had woken up from a dream of coming off of a train into a subway station where a bunch of people were walking around. When I woke up, I could see, even in almost pitch black room, a bunch of people standing all around my bed. I could feel them there. I could even he feel them swaying on the hardwood floor as it creaked and popped with the slightest movement. In my head, I knew it shouldn't make a sound like these things were waiting for me to, to see if I noticed them. I don't know why they were there. I don't know what they wanted. All I knew was I didn't want them to know I did in fact notice them. Luckily, as a child, I was able to drift off to sleep, waking up when the sun came up and being relieved. Now, after having these flashbacks, I was almost overcome with emotion and I'm not a very emotional person. I called my mom and asked her about that house. I asked her if me or my brother ever mentioned anything about that place when we were kids. She paused for a moment and said, yes, we were always talking about seeing things, hearing taps and scratches. Apparently, one night something happened with a babysitter, but the sitter wouldn't comment much, just got paid and left abruptly and briefly mentioning someone outside all night. 
In the end, nothing more came of this. The house today is all burned and boarded up. I don't know of any history of the place. I only have my assumptions. The best I can gather is, this town I used to live in will probably sink into the ground someday due to all the coal mine tunnels beneath it. My mom's father actually worked in these tunnels to make up the seed money for the restaurant they eventually built. Lots of people and immigrants like him lost their lives in those tunnels, but also lots of crime took place in them as well. I'm still not sure I believe in ghosts, but the reason I felt compelled to share my experience is that something is in fact going on. Whether it's sleep paralysis or events like this, the world seems a bit larger than it feels sometimes. And whatever makes up our reality, maybe more malleable than most people like to think. My grandfather came from Italy with his parents in the 40s. They moved from New York to a small town in southeast Oklahoma. When he got older, he met my grandmother and long story short, they were able to build a house for them and their eventual 12 children. And after a few years of just having a carry-out only restaurant, they bought a house in the late 70s to early 80s and turned it into their new restaurants. By this time, they had several grown children which all helped with the renovation of the place. A normal house to which they added on a big dining room. During the renovation, my uncles told me how, when they went upstairs, they found pentagrams made from chicken blood, chicken feathers, and books about the afterlife. When I was about eight, my mom, who was a single parent, took me one Saturday morning to the restaurant to pick something up. She left me in the dining room as she went to the back. After a few moments, which seemed like forever to an eight-year-old, I walked back into the kitchen to find her. I stopped at the drink room and got an overwhelming sense something was wrong. The walls felt like they were closing in around me and I fell to the floor crying. The next thing I remember was my mom running to me and asking me what was wrong. Over the years as I grew up, I would ask my family members about the place. Oddly enough, for a very long time, my uncles wouldn't answer me. But my grandmother told me once that when she'd be there early in the morning food prepping, she would hear a woman humming a tune in the added on dining room. Eventually, in my later teen years, I got a couple of uncles to open up about the place. They always prefaced these conversations with, well, I'm just crazy. But one of my uncles told me he saw a little boy running in the kitchen early one morning. And another told me he saw what looked like a priest wearing a cloth mask, just standing behind the glass window in a door that led from the kitchen to the dining room area. Needless to say, the stories always gave me goosebumps and the memory I had as a child. Well, I just took it as me being a young, scared child. Until one morning, at this point in my life, I was 17 years old. I stayed in an older house up the road from my family's restaurants, and I lived by myself for a couple of years as my mother had moved in with a new boyfriend she met who lived about an hour away. At this point, it was pretty routine I would stay up all night on my PC or Xbox, and when 3 a.m. rolled around, I knew my uncle would be down there making the sauce for a couple of days to store in the walk-in refrigerator. I'd be hungry, and go snack on a few things while we would visit. This morning was the same. I walked in and greeted him, my uncle Peter, who was a local volunteer firefighter and avid Second Amendment believer. He always had a pistol on his hip while being down there alone. I walked to a refrigerator, got some cheese and peppers, and we started talking. After talking for a few minutes, we heard what sounded like someone running from the entrance dining area to the main dining room, full sprint, where they stopped. We both glared at each other and he told me to go around the front to flank anyone there and he would go in straight to the dining room from the kitchen entrance, gun and flashlight drawn. I slowly creeped through the door, heart pounding, 
And I saw his light and heard him say, whoever's in here, come out, I have a gun. There's a ramp that leads down into the dining room with a rail that's full wood all the way to the floor, like a mini wall. We didn't see anyone in the dining room, so figured they'd be behind there. But when we looked, nothing. Suddenly, we heard a loud bang come from where we were in the kitchen. So we ran back up there. All the metal ladles had been taken off their racks and thrown onto the metal steam tables that hold the food during the day during business hours. We looked everywhere, even went outside. We never found a thing. There's always been something about that place that has had a bigger part on my life than I feel I can put into words. A funny little side story is this. When I was in kindergarten, I went to a school not far from the restaurant. One morning, my mom dropped me off and headed for work. I walked into a dark classroom and got scared once again and ran out crying for my mom, just knowing she had just left me thinking I was okay. I must have been truly hysterical, but as I exited the place and ran a bit ways down the road, there she was, waiting on me. I remember her telling a friend later that day she just felt like something was wrong and to wait. The restaurant is still there and thriving till this day. After lots of family issues and going through COVID, it's been a life giver and a reminder of things forgotten and lost. It reminds me that things hold much more weight than the human eye can see.